says, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I am Pastor Alan Buss. Got up early this morning in Belvedere, Illinois, where I serve. I'm the district president. And uh, we'd love to spend some time with you, kind of having a conversation with you and the congregation as far as next steps, uh, thinking about pastoral leadership. So I believe that's going to be at 10 o'clock over in the walk. Looking forward to that, talking about the issues that lie ahead and the blessings that this congregation has received. So uh, let's bow our heads for prayer. Faithful God, your mercies are new to us every morning. And for that, we give you thanks. You have called us by name in baptism, and we are yours. Lord, you know how we struggle with this world. We struggle with ourselves, we struggle with others, and sometimes, Lord, honestly, we struggle with you. But here in this place, you give us peace, and you give us promises. You give us a future. In a world where there's too much heat, we get to be light, because Jesus is the light of the world. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us this morning. Help us dump our garbage at the foot of the cross. May we hear what you want us to hear. May we believe what you want us to believe. And may, do, may we do what you call us to do. We thank you for those who gathered last evening who are here now. We pray for those who are not here. And we especially pray for those who are never here. That we who have been brought near to God may bring others near to the living God. All this we pray through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. <laughs>
Please stand as you are able. We begin with the words spoken when you were baptized. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Take a moment for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father, most merciful God. We confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake he forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We read together the intro. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. Sing to him. Sing praises to him. Tell of all his wondrous works. Glory in his holy name. Let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the works he has done, his miracles and judgments he uttered. O offspring of Abraham, his servant, children of Jacob, his chosen ones, glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. O oh, give thanks to the Lord. Call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples.
us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, give us an increase of faith that, receiving what you have promised, we may love what you have commanded. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. God speaks to us through his word. Please be seated. Bless the morning is from Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 to 9. For you are a people, holy to the Lord of God your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you or chose you. For you were the fewest of all his peoples. But it is because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers, that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We did have to make a last minute song change, so this is not going to be the song in the bulletin, and I apologize. predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among his among many brothers and those whom he predestined he also called 
and those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies, who is to condemn. Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, he was raised. Who, he, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither life nor death, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. according to St. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Jesus said, The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and covered up. Then in his joy he goes out and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls, who on finding one pearl of great value went and sold all that he had and bought it. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was thrown into the sea and gathered fish of every kind. When it was full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers and threw away the bad. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Have you understand all these things? And they said to him, Yes. And he said to them, Therefore, every scribe who has been trained for the kingdom of heaven is like a master of the house who brings out of his treasures what is old and what is new. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please note that the hymn that we're going to sing is about parables and how Jesus uses parables to teach his disciples. You may be seated.
mercy and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. It is great to be back at Holy Cross. And I bring you greetings from the 200 other congregations that are part of the Northern Illinois District. The text, Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven is light. Irene is a friend of mine. She's 90-something. Her and her husband just celebrated their 70th wedding anniversary. She grew up over by when O'Hare wasn't O'Hare, and it was farm fields. She told me some years ago the story of her grandpa and her grandma who farmed over there. And Grandma worked out in the field with Grandpa. These were horse days, not tractor days. And as she's working out in the field, and maybe some of you have worked out in the field, is she lost her wedding ring. Who's going to find the wedding ring? Oh, Grandpa went out and looked, but where would you find it in all that dirt? Gone. For good. And they farmed and did their life. I don't know if he got her a new uh, wedding ring or not. But it's getting to be the end. They sold their land to an airline. They were harvesting oats. And the land had been surveyed. And there is a survey stake. You've seen those survey stakes. One of the helpers, hired hands, noticed something glistening there. Decades, decades later, they found the wedding. What are the odds? I lose things in my house, and I can't find them. Much less losing a wedding ring in a field they found the treasure. Have you ever lost something and years later you found it and you were really surprised that you found it? Have you lost something and you're still looking for it? Stop. Treasures. Jesus talks about treasures. Your treasures and my treasures, but especially his treasures. And if I asked you today, what do you treasure? I think you told me that you treasured coming back to church. Maybe you treasure those times as you think about loved ones who have passed, or you just wish you could go back and have a conversation with somebody who's passed on. Maybe you treasure something that got lost or broken over the years. Maybe you lost your wedding ring. Or maybe you've lost your joy. What are your treasures these days? And it takes maybe a pandemic or some trouble in our lives to remind us what's important. We get so distracted on so many crazy things. And then they're gone and we say, you know what? I need to treasure what I should have treasured. That happens in the church, too. I used to tell Emmanuel and Belvedere, where I served for 17 years, it would be easier for me to preach false doctrine than to change a favorite tradition or custom. It would be easier for me to twist and turn the word of God than to change something that you people like. Now, I didn't go out of my way to make people mad, but it was kind of a gut check to say, what's most important in the church? What's the biggest treasure, the most beautiful treasure? Is it our tradition? Is it my opinion? Or is it the treasure of the church and the treasure of the gospel? 
Do you treasure Jesus? You might sit back and say, Plus, I have been a member of this church for longer than you've been alive. But that's not the question I ask. Do you still treasure Jesus? But I need to tell you, He treasures you. When you were mad at God, when you were far far away from God, when you were caught up in self-righteousness or self-pity, He treasured you. Your treasures. The kingdom of heaven is like a treasure buried in a field. When the man finds the treasure, he steals it. Does he steal the treasure? I'm asking you to answer my question. Does this guy steal the treasure? No, he doesn't. What does he do? He sells everything he's got. He's all in. He wants the treasure. But sometimes we miss. He goes in his joy. He's got joy. Because he's got the treasure. And he's willing to sell it all. To lay it all on the line. He's willing to do something radical. Now that's usually not a part of my vocabulary. Because I'm a German from Wisconsin. We don't do too many radical things. And to be honest with you, I'm just talking about me, not you, but sometimes Germans from Wisconsin can be a little tight with their money. Nobody here like that, huh? You know what's amazing about this text is that this guy is all in. He's going to sell everything because he wants the treasure, because he treasures the treasure. Do you still treasure the treasure? Do you still treasure the treasure? This holy cross still treasure the treasure. The treasure is Jesus. His gospel, his message, his power, his salvation. And it is for you. In the parable, the man buys the field with everything he's got. And Jesus bought you with everything that he had. He laid his life on the line. He shed his blood. He gave his all. And you know what's so remarkable about this is that he dies for the whole world, but he would have died just for you or me. So he's the treasure, and yet in a remarkable way, he treasures you. He treasures Holy Cross. Some of you say, we love Holy Cross. That's a wonderful thing. Love your church. But Jesus loves this church even more than you. Because he bought it with his blood. He laid it all down the line because he had a plan for this church, for this ministry, and the gospel. You are valuable to Him. You are more valuable than silver or gold, but your value is found in His holy, precious blood and His innocent suffering and death. The world is going crazy around us. Our country is in a bad place. And sometimes the church even gets swept away with that. But rejoice. There is joy. And that joy is for you. An evangelical pastor says it this way. Happiness is circumstantial. So for me, happiness was the score of yesterday's Cubs-Brewers game. The Brewers won, in case you didn't know. And that made me happy. As a matter of fact, sitting in that pew last night with somebody wearing a Cubs mask. I did point it out to her, too. She was a good sport. But that's happiness. 
You're sitting back, the Cubs fans are saying, did you don't, did you, do you remember the day before, boss? Do you remember the, when the Cubs beat the Brewers? Or what's going to happen today? That's circumstantial. That's happiness. Joy's relation. You have the most joy in your life when your relationships are good. It starts with your relationship with God. That joy overflows into the other relationships you have. This church can be a place of joy where you are lifted up, where you are cleaned up, where you are loved up, where you are called up. Just in case the disciples didn't get it, and then there's a merchant who's looking for fine pearls. And you know in the second parable, it's the very same thing. When he found the priceless pearl, he went and sold everything and he bought it because he wanted the pearls. Now, you've heard about the pearly gates, right? Revelation chapter 21, verse 21 talks about how heaven has pearly gates. There is a connection between the parable and the gates of heaven. The pearl is the gospel. We radically give, we die to self so that we can live. And when you live for this, there's something that the world craves. The world craves hope. The world craves joy. The world craves meaning. Everything that you have received because you have the treasure. Everything that you have received because you have received the pearl of great price. Now, I don't know what you did. I might have mentioned this, but during the pandemic, I did a lot of cleaning. And what I found remarkable is sometimes I cleaned, and then I put it out by the side of the road to see if somebody wanted my stuff. And I found it remarkable. As a matter of fact, I took a picture of everything that I laid out there. And um, then I noticed people would stop by to see if any of my stuff is something that they wanted. And I kind of watch somebody kind of picture myself and there was like stuff about, well, if somebody's going to take something here, it's, it's going to be this. What was remarkable is what they did take. What do they say? One man's junk is another man's treasure. I get to tell you today, you have been given a treasure. Jesus is your treasure. And Jesus is for you. He shed his blood for you. He laid in the grave for you. He rose again for you. And for this congregation as you launch into the future. One last parable. This is for the fishermen and the disciples, many of whom were fishermen, the kingdom of heaven is like a net thrown into the sea. You get all kinds of fish, both good fish and bad fish. I grew up near the Rock River. I assume when I think about bad fish, I think about carp. Because sometimes don't you wonder if evil's going to win? Sometimes don't you want to start sorting things out and figuring it out yourself? And rather than God being the judge, why don't you be the judge? Now God's word does judge, and God is the judge. And he will sort things out. Evil and sin will not be blessed. The unrighteous will not receive glory in heaven. There is such a place as hell where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. Because sometimes we want to fix things up and we want to purify it all by ourselves. And Jesus warns us against that. Now, I'm not saying we tolerate false doctrine. But I am saying that we judge things based on God's judgment, not ours. Now, how do I know that that's true? Well, I'm a farm boy from Wisconsin. So when Jesus talks about the sower who sows some wheat, and then at night the enemy comes and doesn't sow wheat but sows what? Wheat. And all of a sudden the wheat is growing and the wheat is growing. And 
one of the hired hands says, should we go out there and start pulling out the weeds? And what does he say? No. In the end, the weeds and the wheat will be separated. The righteous will receive glory and the unrighteous judgment. So if you're shaking your head and saying, who's going to make things right? The wonderful thing is we know who's going to make things right. And that is our Lord. He will make things right. You hang on to your faith. You hang on to the scriptures. You be the church that you have been called to be. You be the disciple that you have been called to be. That is your calling. And Jesus himself will come with his angels. And on judgment day will be two groups, the righteous and the unrighteous, the good and the bad. He will make things right. Because I don't know about you, but I kind of watch what's happening in our culture and even this country. It's not the America that I grew up in. The church is the church that I grew up in in so many ways. But it is wonderful to know. And it is confidence giving to know that Jesus has chosen you and he will make things right and right now you get to be light you get to be salt you get to make an eternal difference in a world that's crumbling around us and it is crumbling in a plastic world you have been given the treasure in a fake world you have been given the pearl of great price. So Jesus ends as usually we skip this, but it's rather kind of interesting how Jesus ends it. He says, do you understand? And what do they say? Yes. Do you know what? Let me tell you a secret. They don't. It's kind of like if I said here, do you get the gist of my sermon? And you said, yes. Particularly if you're going to end that sermon soon. Yes, we get it. <laughs> but they don't. So then Jesus says, Therefore, every teacher of the law who has become my disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like an owner of the house who brings out treasures. you got treasures. And did you notice what they are? What kind of treasures are they? Green and gold? They're old and new. They're old and new. Kind of like the Old Testament and the New Testament. I uh, recently had, I have interesting conversations, I had an interesting conversation with somebody who says, we really like our new pastor. What do you like about your new pastor? Because our new pastor preaches the New Testament. And he doesn't preach the Old Testament. Oh, it's a shame on him. You got the wrong pastor. The Old Testament is important. And the New Testament is important. It's all God's word. You've been given treasures. Old ones and new ones. And the new one is what? Jesus who makes all things new. He makes you new. You're not the old person you used to be. You're not that cranky person who swears and does all kinds of stuff. You have been made new in Christ. You are not hopeless. You are hopeful. You are not darkness. You are light. Do you know how I know that? Because that's what Jesus said. I'm going to end with this. George Shultz was Secretary of State during President Reagan's term. And Secretary of State manages world affairs for the President. And uh, ambassadors work under the Secretary of State. So he would bring all the new ambassadors in and he would talk about their duties. And then he had on the side of his room a globe. And so he would challenge, he'd ask every ambassador to go find their country on the globe. So the ambassador for Taiwan would find Taiwan, and the ambassador for Norway would find Norway, and the ambassador for Chile would find Chile. Except Mike Mansfield. 
He was going to be ambassador to Japan. When George Shultz says, go find your country, he goes and points to the United States. This is my country. This is your Savior. He is your treasure. He's the best thing God ever gave you or ever will give you. This is your church. Here treasures of old and new are given. Lastly, it's not just about you. Every time I come to this church, I drive here, and before I look at the church, I look at that high school. That's just part of your mission field. After I look at that, I look at that beautiful building called the Law. And I think to myself, there has to be a huge connection between how you minister there and how you minister here. And then I see this sanctuary. And I see you. If Jesus did not treasure you, Holy Cross wouldn't be in existence. And I want you to know this morning that because I treasure Holy Cross, and the church at large treasures Holy Cross. That's why I'm here. Because this is your church. This is your time. And best of all, Jesus is your Savior. Your only Savior. Amen. We make confession of our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. As you are able, please stand. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under the was so crucified and died in this earth. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From the men he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, and the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the last. In our special prayers this morning, we pray for all the sick, we pray for our nation, we pray for the church here and around the world. We also pray especially for uh, Jeannie Donahue, that she would receive God's healing and comfort. We also pray for Barbara and Tanya, who are uh, Darlene Schmidt's sister and niece. Let us pray to the Lord. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we thank you for the great and precious treasures that you have given to us. We thank you for the Word of God. We thank you for the church here and around the world. We thank you for the clear message of law and gospel, sin and grace. We thank you that you laid your whole life on the line so that we might have eternal life. May we treasure the gifts that you have given to us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Thank you for this congregation. For the past, for the present, and the future. Guide us by your Holy Spirit. And may we be led to fulfill the calling and mission that we have. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for Jeannie, Jean, Barbara, and Tanya, the lonely, the afflicted, the bitter, the addicted. 
We pray for those dealing with cancer and depression and their families. Grant healing according to your good and gracious will. Strengthen family and friends and, and thank you for those who cheer the struggling on. Lord, in your mercy, we are prayer. For our nation, all our elected and appointed leaders, for those struggle, those uh, working on uh, uh, working with the coronavirus, those looking for remedies. We also pray for places in our nation right now that are uh, uprooted by riots, civil disobedience, anger, hatred. Lord, we ask you to uh, help us listen. Help us be faithful to our calling. And we pray that evil would not succeed or destroy this nation. Help us also have a better understanding of those who do not think like us or look like us or act like us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. Bless the offerings that we give. They are given to your honor and glory. And thank you for your rich generosity. We never outgive you. Thank you for the volunteers who serve in this congregation, who give up time, ability, and money for the sake of that kingdom which has no end. Lord, in your mercy, Lord, our prayer. for the schools of our land, including the high school across the street, for students, and faculty, administration, Help us, dear God, as a congregation to have a sense of where you are leading us and what you would have us do. And forgive us for when we have failed you and when we have failed each other. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. We remember those who have gone before us, who heard their Savior say, well done, good and faithful servant. We pray for those who come after us. And may we hear our Savior say, well done. All these, all this, and so much more, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The Lord be with you. Give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who out of love for his fallen creation humbled himself by taking the form of a servant becoming obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Risen from the dead, he has freed us from eternal death and given us life everlasting. Therefore, with angels, the archangels, the whole company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, And teach us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, he took bread. When he did him thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Now to the body of Jesus and his holy and precious blood given in this sacrament, strengthen and preserve you unto life everlasting. Your sins are forgiven. Amen. As you are able, please stand. a foretaste of the feast to come in the holy supper of your son's body and blood keep us firm in the true faith throughout the days of our pilgrimage that on the day of his coming we may together with all your saints celebrate the marriage feast of the lamb in his kingdom which has no end through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you and the holy spirit one god now and forever The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace.
Again, a reminder of the meeting that will be over in the law. And if, even if this isn't your church home, but you're curious about this church, I'm not a member of this church, and I'm going to be there. And I'm looking forward to listening to you and also giving you, from my point of view, some perspective on this congregation. Because you are a treasure. And you belong to our Lord. So, if you can make it, that would be great. Pray for your church. Serve hard. And remember that you don't stand alone. Jesus stands with you. And the church, the Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod, has been trying to stand with you too. That's what it means to be the church. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen.